All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I am Rebecca Gordon. I am the Culinary Projects Lead with the Aerial Food Institute, and I also work really closely with the School of Hospitality, Food, and Tourism Management. We are so excited to welcome you here today to Deep Dish Dialogues. We took a little break in the summer, and now we're rejuvenated and, and excited to be able to welcome people back into the Nita Stewart Food Lab for today's presentation, which is going to be exploring preservation. And there are, were quite a few different reasons why we decided to go with the preservation route. First of all, just a little bit of the history here in this space in the Nita Stewart Memorial Food Lab. It was actually built in 1903 and it was part of the McDonald Institute and a big part of their program was domestic sciences and a lot of the students would, would learn how to properly preserve food um, that was done safely um, so everyone could, could still continue to, to eat their lovely local foods throughout the year, but also doing it safely. So we wanted to kind of do a little nod to that and now see over, over 120 years later um, what we're doing here. And um, the second reason behind our, our kind of preservation theme is that it's the perfect time for that. Our gardens right now are, are full. It's kind of the peak season with the harvest and everyone's really busy doing finding different ways to preserve their food. So we thought it'd be great to have a conversation with three great experts from the University of Guelph today to be able to understand a little bit more about what we can do to preserve, what, what we need to do safely, um, and we'll see kind of where the conversation goes. Um, so another thing I just want to mention before we begin is that the Nita Stewart Memorial Food Lab is at the University of Guelph, and it resides on the ascent ancestral lands of the Audubon people and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. This area is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which is a pre-colonial agreement, which uh, teaches us a really important lesson that we should all only use and take what we need and make sure that we are preserving all of our resources and the land for future generations to use. So this is always an important lesson for us to keep in mind. And I think we're gonna have some of these things kind of flowing through throughout our conversation today. So that's enough of me talking and, and introducing the, the event today. I would now like to invite our uh, two of our guests. So first of all, we have VJ Nair, who is the executive chef of Guelph Hospitality Services. He has a, a huge range of experience. He has, <laughs> we're always bugging him to do events. He's in high demand, so we're really lucky to have him here. Um, but he hails from India, and he's done a lot of work even working on cruise ships and um, at different universities. And we are so lucky to have him here working for us. Yeah at the University of Guelph. I'm very fortunate to, have, to be here. <laughs> and then our second expert that I'm going to bring up to our stage is Michael Smith. He is the manager of the Guelph Center for Urban Organic Farming here at the <laughs> University of Guelph. And um, Mike does a lot of work, aside from he's farming and He's also just, I think, training and teaching a lot of different students about the farm, and it's really important for us for our connection um, here at the University of Guelph. When we pride ourselves on being Canada's food university, it's definitely important that we have a farm like the Guelph Center for Urban Organic Farming. So thank you to you two for joining me today. I'm going to maybe, maybe come in a little bit closer to make sure that our cameras are capturing us. Um, but just I want to kind of kick it off, first of all. Mike, can you tell us what is happening at the garden right now? How's your season been and where are you at right now? Sure, so the Gulf Center Urban, Ag uh, Urban Organic Farming is a, department, uh, a program of the Department of Plant Agriculture here at the University of Guelph. So we're located within the grounds of the Arboretum. For those of you farther afield, it's like a botanical garden that's located right here on campus. We're a one hectare, about a two and a half acre demonstration site and we grow dozens of different types of predominantly vegetables with some fruits, herbs, and flowers. Um, this time of year, as you alluded to, it's the time of bounty. It's where you have that summer harvest and that fall harvest just uh, overlapping. So we haven't quite had cold weather enough to take out those summer crops. So right now we've had a really wet summer. And so as a result, some of our fruiting crops haven't done as well, but a lot of our green crops, you know, our kales, our lettuces, things like that, have really been in bounty this right now. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. So then now... Um hospitality services. It's a big season right now. We just welcome back a lot of students. How many, how many students is it that you cook for? Yeah, so hospitality services on campus operates close to 20 different locations. Um, we have about 5,000 students in residence, 12 to 14,000 who go in and out of campus. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we used to do up to upwards of 3,000 uh, events a year. Um, so on an average, we, are, we do about 15 to 20,000 meals a day. Uh, we have a big team. I'm part of I'm one among, uh, it's a huge team. We have close to 1,000 staff who work during the season from August till, uh, till April. 
Uh, we we have about 50, 50 uh, of our team members who work year round. We have about two hundred or so who work. Uh, it, it's called limited full time who work during the school year, which is which is from September till uh, April. And then we have about three hundred part time part time staff, and uh, and then we have about five hundred student employees who help us get through the the. Insanity, I would say, from uh, <laughs> from uh, from uh, from end of August till end of April. Uh, just to give you brief volumes, you know, uh, we go through in, in this brief eight to nine months about 450 tons of vegetables uh, is kind of what we process in our kitchens. Um, about uh, three quarters of a million eggs, uh, uh, 120,000 pounds of. Uh, Chicken over forty thousand pounds of beef. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know it's, if people are really taking in your numbers. <laughs> that is a lot. It's, 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 it's huge volume. So just to put in perspective, it's about hundred pallets of food a week for in a week that we go through. It's 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 we have a big shopping cart. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the places that you shop from mm -hmm. is the Gulf Center That's for correct, Urban Organic yeah. Farming. Is that correct? That yeah. That's correct. Yes. So I'm wondering, how is it that that relationship works? How um, like who who do you go to Mike and you ask him for certain things, or Mike, are you thinking of what the hospitality services work? How do you work together? Yeah, I think uh, it's part of. Our, I think it comes. It, it comes down to our uh, food philosophy with hospitality. Uh, we. Uh, it, it's very simple for us. We want to make sure we uh, we cook the best food we can, uh, source as much locally as possible, and so the organic farm just fits right into what we what we strive to do all the all the time. Uh, Mike and I have worked together for a few years. We 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 we, we are constantly on the phone. We talk quite a bit. Uh, typically during December, we kind of discuss, hey, what is best uh, that he can grow the next year. Like, again, last year the season was different. This year it's a completely different season, so it, it changes. So it's um, it, it, it's it's you know I, I think what we have, what we've done on our side is basically uh, unlike. Uh, many of the operations where we have a fixed menu and we order vegetables and, pro and produce based on what the menus are, we've kind of tried to kind of learn a little bit from some of the uh, trend-setting chefs, you know, people like Dan Barber and uh, stuff like that on, 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 like on third plate. So we kind of leave it to <laughs> the farmers who can grow best and tell us what they have, and then we figure out the menus based on that. So that's kind of, we're really trying to uh, bring the culture into our kitchen. So uh, it's a slow process, but uh, you're working away at it. Mm -hmm. And how do you find how that process works on your end? Is it, there's so much on predictability, it can be challenging. So how one, do you manage it? Yeah, so one of the unique things about our operation is about growing about 60 different uh, crops, um, you know, in a given season. I don't know which ones are going to do well. So maybe 20 of them will do really well, 20 of them aren't going to do so well, and 20 of them are kind of in the middle. Um, and so that gives me the buffer to still know that I'm going to have stuff for VJ, but I don't always know which one and how much. Um, and so that diversity is my crop insurance um, mm -hmm. in a given year. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm assuming then probably one thing that really helps then is that VJ also has that flexibility on his end to be able to take in what you need. And yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, his staff were, uh, were great. So the, operationally, I, I message them every week saying this is what I have and we figure out a day when that works best for both of us in order to facilitate the, the picking mm -hmm. and the transiting to, to them. From me as a farmer, it's lovely because I can say, hey, I got some stuff. Are you guys available to come You know, on Friday at three o'clock? And then the truck just shows up at the farm and it goes right from our wash station into the truck. Um, so in terms of that freshness, it is wow. pretty much as fresh as you can get. That's great. And I think, yeah, the key thing you're really highlighting is it's important that we know our farmers, we have yeah. these conversations. Um, I know in, in the restaurant industry as well, some people are really good at that. It takes a lot more time and effort, and I'm sure in the scale of your, yes. your operation, for sure, it would take more time for you to figure out what's going on. But uh, there's definitely so many benefits to being able to kind of build that relationship. The fresh food, it's delicious. You know you're supporting your local community, so that's, yeah. that's really great. One thing that uh, the partnership that we did this year was that VJ lent me a couple of his staff members um, over the course of the summer. Wow. So some of those folks that work in the kitchen yeah. got to come out and plant and weed and harvest some of those crops that then came back into your kitchen. And I believe that one individual actually then processed a whole bunch yeah. of that yeah. stuff yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. So they got the full cycle of mm -hmm. you know how their one actions earlier in the season affected it throughout and then ultimately yeah. at the end product. Yeah, that's really powerful. I think for your team to be able to actually see yes. where some of the food is coming from. Yes, so I think uh, that's one of the... Uh, most important things that we want to inculcate in our in our teams as well is to um, uh, to really learn and have a connection with the food. So that way they appreciate food, they handle it better, they don't waste food. I think uh, that we find uh, more and more in the industry and, and in the general population, people are too disconnected from food. 
and that is why they don't appreciate what it takes to grow food. So the you know you you really look at a tomato and and you know there's a small speck on it and you throw it away in the bin. Uh, but if there's somebody who's involved in it and knows, hey, you got to have the seedlings, uh, you know, you got to seed them in uh, March and it takes about two close to two months in the greenhouse and then you got to take your time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, prepare a field, plant it out there, and you don't harvest your first uh, tomato till about end of, uh, in the middle of July, end of July. You know, it, it, there's there's so much work that goes into growing a tomato. We really want to get our, our younger cooks to appreciate that, and hopefully in the years down the line, you know, they, they, they see value in making sure, you know, I appreciate local food, appreciate farming, because uh, uh, that's the only way to change our food culture. So. Mm -hmm. And then it's that also then kind of, it's not just our, our chefs who are, and cooks who are learning, it's also our students on campus yeah. as well too. How do you interact with students at the farm? So we connect uh, have a number of touch points with different courses. So we have uh, students from a, a, a wide variety of disciplines, many within the Department of Plant Agriculture, but not exclusively within the broader umbrella of the OAC, but even ones outside of that. So we have some folks like in history and things like that that come in to, to join us in the sciences. So we do tours, we do supplement um, some coursework and some curriculum based on some of the education that I provide um, um, with the touch points I have with students. Students can approach us for whether or not they want any projects on the farm. Uh, sometimes we'll partner and do some research uh, on the farm. So there's a number of different ways that they can get involved as well um, to see how, whether it's their specific learning goals for their course or whether it's much more broader um, in terms of some of the community actions that we do and partnerships that we have with some of our community partners. That's great. And is there anywhere where people can learn more about the farm or where, where they can purchase food from the farm? Uh, yeah, so we do a sliding scale market um, on campus on Thursdays uh, from now until uh, Thanksgiving at least, maybe a little longer depending on that weather uh, variable, uh, from 11 until 2. Um, that way also the food is more accessible for our students. Um, so by having a sliding scale, we cite them at retail and a wholesale price and then they tell us what they're going to pay in between. Costs are so expensive for students right now, it's something small that we can do that uh, helps you know cover our costs but also makes it more accessible for them. Um, besides uh, providing to BJ, we also donate to our campus food bank. Um, so depending on a student's means, they can get access to the food from uh, a lot of different venues. Um, but yeah, we, we take volunteers uh, regularly, so anyone who's interested in volunteer can go online and look up uh, whether through our socials or on our website, they can uh, get in touch with us that way, and they can come and get their hands dirty and uh, you know, do some harvesting, do some planting, um, and uh, you know, whether they have like a little bit of time or a lot of time, they can kind of you know, jump in based on their own availability. <laughs> That's great. The garden is one of my favorite places on campus besides obviously the Anita Stewart Memorial for <laughs> that, but it's always a, a really great place to go. I just feel like there's like a magic in the air almost and being able to pick blackberries off and eat them and <laughs> it's wonderful. But um, we have kind of come to our time here. It's time to segue into more talk about preservation, but um, thank you for joining us today, Mike, and I really encourage everyone to, to learn more and reach out to, to participate in the farm. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, and so now we're going to kind of, um, I guess, VJ, do you want to talk a little bit more about your philosophy with, sure. yeah. with food and how you handle uh, preservation? Yeah, I think uh, for us uh, at Hospitality and Pride, again, like I mentioned before, uh, we've, um, uh, I think uh, we want to do great food, uh, uh, cook uh, with as much local produce as possible, and uh, we also have to be conscious of our uh, uh, the financial aspects, but we try to get uh, source as much locally as possible uh, within Ontario uh, and within the local. You know, we have connections with over 60 f different farmers in in on campus. We go to the Elmira Produce Auction. We work. We get produce from the Ignatius Farm. We grow. We have a small patch in in, in the Bobby Greenhouse, which is a chef's garden. We we again we try different crops. That is all. It's, it, much of it is to really uh, educate our cooks cooks to uh, know how how hard it's grow. Not how hard it is to grow, to really appreciate uh, what it takes to grow food and, and, and kind of uh, really relate that back into our kitchens and, 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 and our teams, overall teams. Um, uh, other than that, uh, one, of the, one of the key things uh, that we do on campus, I think, uh, like our, ha like our um, uh, tagline, international flavors, local ingredients, uh, I think food, uh, food is, the, is the big uh, uh, unifier on campus. Uh, food brings people together. Uh, so we try a lot of different flavors. We have, we do a lot of research. We try our best. Not everything works well, uh, but uh, we go back and we have about uh, 12 or 15 different nationalities uh, that are represented in our kitchens. Uh, they all bring different uh, different ideas. We put it all together, and uh, if you have eaten on campus in any of the different locations, there is a huge variety all the time. Not like like I said, it's not perfect all the time, but we try to do our best, and we get our groups to train consistently, do our research, and and. Um, 
and and that's kind of really what our what our idea is to do good good strong good food. Uh, try to cook as much as possible in house. Anybody who is in the industry knows how difficult it is to retain people and, and to get skill staff. So that is one of the biggest challenges that we've been facing in the last few years. But um, uh, but uh, besides that, uh, we keep away at it. And yeah, I think, uh, are you going to go to the yeah. oh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been trying to show some photos. Yeah. So we were talking about the organic farm earlier. Yeah. This is a photo of yeah, that. That's uh, that's uh, that's Mike's uh, Mike's home there. Mm -hmm. It's it's beautiful. It's. Uh, it's 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 you know anybody anybody who's on campus have to go to the garden at least once a week. It is from April till uh, end of July, August, September. It's a beautiful place. So we get a lot of food uh, into our kitchens. The the basil is from our the chef's garden. We we call it bucket crop. We have a lot of uh, muffin batter pails that are left over at the end of the year. <laughs> so we grow uh, uh, eggplants and uh, peppers and. Um, and, uh, and, and basil, any kind of herbs that we can kind of process and put away, and that's kind of really the idea. We get great support from the Bowie Greenhouse. Roger Chance is the uh, uh, technician there. Roger is amazing. He has helped us over the years. We started this around 2015. We started doing microgreens um, uh, in the garden and to use for our special events. Uh, some of our cooks and some of our, uh, some of our team members got interested in it, and then, you know, it's kind of uh, um, gone, it's taken on uh, from there. So. That's that's some of the peppers we grew a couple of years back at the Bobby Greenhouse. Um, we try to change things over, and again, the mo uh, like I, like I said before, the motivation for uh, processing or preservation is really that uh, you know we get amazing produce during these few months. Uh, we want to make sure we make the best use of it for our students and for our university community, um, and 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 the best way to do is to kind of find find ways to process and put away things that we can use. Uh, the, the, our operations are really busy from September to April. After the students leave, you know, May and June are busy for conferences. You know, they, we have the Toronto Argonauts who come in, in May. Uh, it is not as busy during the summer as uh, during the school year. So we do start getting produce from June, July, when we get, you know, lots of asparagus and radishes and all these things start coming in from June. So we try to, you know, uh, there are lots of farmers we have connected to. You know, there are times when we have done a thousand pounds of asparagus and uh, put it away. So, uh, or you know, in the summer when we get um, uh, uh, strawberries, or uh, we we buy, you know, a few hundred pounds of strawberries and make them into <laughs> and make them into a, a, a coolie or a compote and put it away. But the thing is, for the volumes we use, it, it usually gets used up uh, by the end of September before Thanksgiving. We go through all that, <laughs> and, and and that's and we are really limited by space uh, as to how much we can process and put away, but. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are fortunate that we have such a huge volume to deal with from September. So mm -hmm. I, I hadn't really clued in about the storage, just for the volume of food yeah. that you have, having to find a space to store it. I worked in a restaurant, and we had our entire basement full of, yeah, <laughs> of yeah. preserved food, yeah, but yeah. then it was such a smaller scale than a university. So definitely another another challenge for us to keep in mind. That is correct. Yeah, we have a couple of big freezers, but then it's it's never enough. Um, uh, like, uh, like Rebecca mentioned, you know, for the volumes we go through, uh, we, we, uh, we kind of uh, rented out freezers outside uh, to put uh, pallets of food away. That's kind of an indication of how much stuff that we process once in a while, yeah. you know. Uh, 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 again, uh, the asparagus is Millennium Asparagus that was developed by Dave Wallen at uh, Plant Agriculture. Uh, so we, we, one of the farmers was growing this particular asparagus, so we got it in and, and it, it, it lasts us for a while. Uh, we, we're really limited by the certain things that don't, uh, you know, this asparagus obviously when it's processed, put away, cannot be used for a salad or anything because obviously it's blanched and, and we have a plaster less and we put it away, but, but we can be, it can be used for things like a quiche or a frittata and stuff like that. that we, so we, we just had to figure out how, to, how best to use it uh, and, and, uh, and figure out what best to apply these uh, uh, processed or preserved vegetables into. Uh, that's uh, that's when I think Mike had a lot of zucchini or yellow, <laughs> yellow zucchini. We had a bunch of uh, a bunch of relish. Again, it's a huge volume. So I think uh, bef uh, in the years before we've done a lot of uh, small batches in in, in, in big uh, in two liter jars. But off late, uh, just because uh, you know again space constraints, we have increased uh, the offerings on campus. We've taken up more space, so we started doing them in big uh, big uh, buckets or big pails. So. Yeah, when you do stuff, it's usually a few hundred pounds. So it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> like a lot of chefs, I think when uh, the when the Noma guide to fermentation from uh, from uh, from uh, Noma came out, I think uh, 
uh, some of chefs are, you know, maybe romantic, not as, uh, you know, not as, uh, no, I don't think all of us are as cranky as you see on reality TV, so <laughs> we, 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 we thought, you know, what this is that we're going to do, um, we're going to do some fancy fermentation, and, and, you know, a lot of us got into projects in, in uh, July and August, and uh, after the first week, reality hit and said, that's going to work, so, <laughs> you know, it, it might work for normal for, you know, with a pound of beets for uh, preserved for six weeks, but, you know, we go through way, way, way more, mm -hmm. so. Uh, that's why yeah. we started to quick quickly and all that. So. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So maybe that's a really great segue now. Yeah. So I'm going to invite our next speaker. So uh, Dr. Keith Werner, who's a microbiologist in the uh, Department of Food Science. He teaches courses in food microbiology and also um, also teaches courses as well in uh, food safety. So we brought him in today because he can help us kind of learn a little bit more about some of the food safety aspect of preservation. Um, he has. So much knowledge. He's just in our, our planning of this event. He's taught me so much about things that I've never thought about, <laughs> which is maybe a little scary. Um, but for for me and my own food safety. But but thank Always you, good. thank you for being here, Keith. Maybe just to kind of kick it off. Do you want to just maybe tell us a little bit about how you entered into this field of food microbiology and safety? Oh, this could take a long time. Okay, I mean, briefly. <laughs> oh no, I'll give you the okay. uh, sign up. So. Um, when I was at school, my best friend wanted to be a chef. Uh, I thought, well, yeah, just follow your friend, isn't it? So I actually mm -hmm. went to catering college uh, after school. I then got employed by the in the food industry. I went from job to job because um, I didn't like the decisions of the management. Uh, mainly the decision was sacking me because I was no good at cooking. Oh. So that's what I thought. <laughs> you should have given me a chance. So anyway, to the point, um, I then went to college to learn food science because you kind of have a connection with it and uh, then I went to the University of Nottingham to do a food science degree then to Aberdeen Swift to do a uh, degree in a PhD in microbial physiology then went to Nottingham to do food science uh, postdoctoral fellow and he ended up in Guelph uh, 2001 so uh, no, 2002 I'll tell a lie so <laughs> I've been here ever since and I kind of uh, look at food safety, that's our main sort of uh, research in terms of ensuring produce is decontaminated effectively, doing risk analysis. I also go on radio and TV sometimes for communication. I feel like it's all the time lately. <laughs> well, I was on one yesterday. <laughs> I'm honestly, I was 17 interviews in, I just lost steam. But anyway, um, but I also teach obviously food safety management systems and food microbiology. And I think the reason I'm here today is uh, because because we're talking about industrial microbiology and part of that is food fermentations and so I guess that's why I'm here that's and I'll exactly hopefully why. I'll impart some uh, information. Perfect. Okay so how about then VJ? Yeah. do you want to walk us through so I think you're going to show us how to do a quick pickle. Sure. I'm going to have you move it here a little bit. Alright. direction. Uh, <laughs> Alright so um, Pickling actually is one of the most uh, ancient forms of food preservation. Obviously back in the day our early ancestors had harvested but they didn't have freezer room or anything like that. So they had to, a way of preserving it. And in addition to fresh produce, obviously they made things like beer, well what, what looked like beer, would be a beer to us, and wine. And essentially what happened, obviously, the wine spoiled to make acetic acid, which we know as vinegar. And I think they, somebody just had the notion, let's mix the two together and voila, they preserve them. So with vinegar, um, people use it for all kinds of things, as a sanitizer, you know, cleaning pans or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the thing with vinegar, though, the way it acts on uh, microbes, it's a slow death. It basically depletes their ability to produce energy. And this is why it's not very good sanitizer, because it takes uh, E. coli, for example, uh, five days to die off in vinegar. And uh, how old these pickles there, uh, VJ? It's about four days, is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all right. It's more than a week. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, put you on the spot. <laughs> so the thing is, you've got to uh, leave it uh, a certain amount of time for the vinegar to work. Now, obviously, you can get lots of different vinegars. Um, of wine vinegar. You might have heard of basemic vinegar, the most expensive vinegar out there. It takes 12 years what to is make. It? What is it Basemic. Basemic? 
Yeah, yeah. have anyone tasted it before? Well, you must have done. Yeah. It's uh, the balsamic or... Balsamic, yeah. yeah. Oh, balsamic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Accents. The accent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's about $200 uh, dollars a bottle, and it takes 12 years to produce. And you can make cider vinegar out of apple uh, cider, malt vinegar out of beer. But um, what VJ is doing is using white vinegar from spirit because you don't, I guess you don't want to impart flavors too much, do you? That is correct, yeah. So the first one is the very, very basic, simple vinegar that I think everybody does at home. Uh, this is kind of what we do for our, some of our shops on campus, be it uh, the Sharma location in, in UC, and you always find pickles in, in any of the uh, stations on campus. So it is very simple uh, turnips, we cut them into, into sticks. Um, it's white vinegar, sugar, and salt, uh, with, uh, bay leaf, garlic. Uh, yeah, I think there are millions of recipes on, on, online as to uh, how to how you know everybody can everybody has their own uh, uh, twist to it. We use a very basic and simple recipe, so it's just uh, sugar, salt, uh, vinegar. Bring it to a boil with bay leaf or garlic. Uh, we have uh, uh, turnips uh, cut. Uh, when it comes to a boil, put it in and we put it away in the fridge with some beets just for the color. Uh, sorry, as you have in your uh, tasting plate, and then it's usually a week later we uh, we start using them. And because of volumes, again, uh, we don't risk leaving it in the fridge too long. Uh, we probably do about 100, 120 pounds every every couple of weeks, or maybe more. So, uh, it, 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 and, and and that's that's uh, that's why we thought of a, a quick pickle. It's very easy. It's, it's not too complicated. It's, we are not leaving it in the fridge it's too long. Um, I know we cover any food safety issues and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so what's the or either of you will answer, what's the difference between a quick pickle and a pickle that you get? And a can, sure. or a jar. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you have something called quick pickling, and they call it regular pickling, whichever. So with regular pickling, what they'll do is they'll make the brine and the, with the vinegar, but then they'll heat process the actual pickle in the jar. The reason for doing that, obviously, is to kill off the microbes. Now, quick pick. Uh, quick pickling, uh, you don't do any thermal processing step. You're basically relying on the vinegar to do its job to kill off the nasty bugs and the spoilage microbes. But there are obviously microbes that still exist, especially the wild yeast. So this is why you can go into the shop and you'll see all these pickles on the shelf at room temperature because they're being regularly pickled, i.e. pickled and then firmly processed. But with um, sort of pickles that are using this process, we have to refrigerate them for the simple reason there's still microbes microbes there. And another thing to watch for if you're home pickling is the type of vinegar. So you might think vinegar is vinegar, but it's not quite. You can get pickling vinegar, which is much more stronger. You know, it can go up to 20%. Normal vinegar by law is 4%. And when a recipe comes saying add half a cup of vinegar, you've got to kind of question, say, well, is it pickling vinegar or is it just normal vinegar? I assume normal vinegar yeah, in this yeah, case. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so you just got to be careful of that because if you don't acidify enough, then the pathogens can come through and spoil, and your poor pickles spoil, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, a very basic recipe like everybody does at home. So we uh, bring it to a boil uh, and then pour it in, uh, let it cool down, and uh, in the fr let it cool down, we leave it in the fridge, after a week, it's ready to use, so. Perfect. Maybe we'll just pop it over. Okay. Yeah, over the here thing to watch for, camera uh, the thing to watch for is the certain amount of vegetables and, uh, that are good to pickle. I had someone who was trying to make a pickle out of broccoli sprouts and lettuce uh, just two weeks ago. It gives a lot of bitterness because there's so much chlorophyll. And I think the reason why beets work, or you're the expert, VJ, is the texture, isn't it? Yes. You know, if you can't, you've got to work with texture, and that's yeah. why cabbage is so good as well. Yeah. But so uh, yeah, trying to do a tomato could be a bit tricky, just a bit. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so you've been um, doing some media as well and talking about like TikTok trends and challenges with where you can buy pickles. Do you have any recommendations on how to make sure you're properly finding your pickles? Oh, pickling. <laughs> pickling, yeah. Yeah, a few months ago over the summer, there was a, uh, a TikTok video went viral and it was uh, during the pandemic, this person, you know, she did home pickling and she wanted to expand. It's called Pickle Me Everything. Uh, the trouble was, going from a uh, kitchen to large-scale production was a bit problematic and she made lots of mistakes. And the, the risk you have in pickling, as I mentioned to you, is not adding enough vinegar. 
or not adding enough salt. If you don't add those, then again, you could get uh, pathogens growing like botulinum. There have been some outbreaks linked to uh, fermented vegetables for the simple reason they didn't have enough vinegar to get the pH down low enough. And so when you are going to pickle me everything, because I think she's up online again, you know, just be wary that they've got these things in place. And when you go to farmers markets especially, you've got to be very wary. Um, there was this one case a few years ago where somebody was pickling sausage, raw sausage, saying, oh yeah, the vinegar takes care of it. Not quite. So you've just got to be wary about that. But typically, as uh, VJ said, it's a kind of foolproof recipe. You've just got to get, make sure you've got the right vinegar concentration and obviously the salt as well. So we can definitely do that then. I hope so. <laughs> we'll find recipes, make sure we're doing it properly. And I think we're about to kind of segue into the next thing, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a shout out. Um, Food Day Canada is... Um, a huge celebration that, that we celebrate here in the Nita Stewart Memorial Food Lab. Um, and they are, are all about promoting our Canadian food. And they are actually doing a pickling competition with the uh, Royal Canadian uh, Ag Agricultural Winter Fair. And uh, they have a special Food Day Canada class. So I highly recommend, if we haven't scared you away from regular thermal processing pickling, uh, I highly encourage you to enter because there's a, a wonderful competition that's happening and it'd be great to see some people um, submitting their, their pickles that they have. As their, I can their do recipes. a pickle then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so do you have anything else that you wanted to add about pickling? I feel like you, you captured it all there. Yeah, like I say, if you pick the right, uh, you can mix lots of thing, different things together. You just avoid certain fruit and vegetables to do it. And like I say, sterilizing containers is key because if you're not going to firmly process it then you need to rely on the uh, sort of vinegar and salt to do the trick and if you are thermal processing you've got to literally make sure your salt concentration and the vinegar at the right concentration you know i could tell you a few botulism outbreaks that have been incurred by that here in canada as well i think there was one just last year in the u.s so You've got to be careful if you're firmly processing. But once they go into the fridge, I think, VJ, they'll last about a month, three months sometimes, isn't it? The uh, regular pickles? Yeah. Yeah. Even longer. Yeah. So, uh, but another sort of thing to watch out for is the salt. Um, you might think salt is salt, which I guess it is. Um, very critical, like uh, our ancestors obviously got salt and mixed it with food and said, oh yeah, it preserves it. But you've got to get the right salt. So I think using kosher salt in this case, uh, kosher salt is what as mortals have in the kitchen. Uh, it's nothing to do with Jewish faith or anything like that. But uh, with kosher salt, or what we call table salt, table salt's got iodide in because you think we need iodine. Um, I don't know how that balances out with this high sodium uh, but also what it's got is silicates so silicates make the salt flow better uh, but the trouble is when you do pickling it'll be like a sediment at the bottom it'll go cloudy you think wow something's grown in my pickles so what you try to use is what we call curing salt much finer no iodine which gives a bitterness, no silicates, which gives the cloudiness. But you've got to be careful to store it because it'll just go into a solid block because so, uh, you know, salt yeah. just like literally is a magnet for water, which why it preserves. So yeah, curing salt, uh, if, well, I don't know where you buy it from, to be honest, but uh, just be prepared. But if you are doing normal pickles with normal salt and you see this turbidity and precipitation, it's not uh, anything growing, it's literally just precipitating good to know there you go you. now you know <laughs> okay so now we'll segue into the next thing so uh vj you're going to be demonstrating how to make a kimchi or your that's version of, of the kimchi that is yes that's, that's a better <laughs> <way to make. laughs> um but maybe first of all yeah how about you yeah how okay. about you walk us through yeah. your steps for so kimchi? uh i'm no expert in uh pickling but um I think in the last few years I've been doing more uh, Excel and Outlook than being in the kitchen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, this, so we have a we have a, a cook who's uh, originally from Korea. So it's funny. Uh, here's an Indian version guy doing a demo <laughs> with a Korean recipe, but this is all put together. The the sample that he put together is by a Vietnamese cook. So it's. Uh, it's uh, it's, and, it's the United um, Nations here. So. I'm going to interrupt as well too. Just for those who are who are in person here, we do have those plates there. You're welcome to eat as we go along. So the the pink. Pink is yeah, the pickle. Oh, yeah, it's the pickle, the pickle at the time. Um, yeah. So you're welcome to eat that as as we talk as well yeah. too. So don't feel like you have to wait. Yeah. Okay. Now we'll let you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so uh, kimchi, um, uh, very traditional, but so we, we so we do quite a bit of kimchi for our stations in uh, 
for a pop-up station and in infusion if you'll be into chef's hall. Uh, so different different cooks and different chefs have different uh, different ways to do it. Uh, this is kind of a recipe from if anybody has followed uh, a blogger called Manchi. It's kind of very it's taken off her, but kind of is approved by our Korean uh, cooks. <laughs> uh, I got a I got a lesson in how uh, to soak the cabbage today. So uh, oh, uh, always <laughs> learning. Yes, that's <laughs> so good. So uh, it's very simple again. Uh, what you do is uh, cabbage. It needs to be salted. And um, and we uh, that salted and, and we we did for an hour and a half two hours uh, to get uh, get the water out and really that is that is one of the most uh, important uh, important parts of uh, doing the kimchi. Uh, the next part obviously is to cook off. Yeah, we got okay, a, a camera here okay. that we can. Okay, so the the other I'm I'm trying to make it much faster. So so this is a glutinous rice flour that has been cooked off and we add a little bit of sugar to it. And the idea here is to really to uh, mix the uh, the seasoning. So we have it, 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 to make a paste that is going to coat the coat the cabbage. So into the rice flour paste goes uh, the gochigara, which is a very uh, very uh, traditional Korean uh, chili pepper flakes, uh, ginger, garlic. Uh, we have uh, some carrots, uh, radish, some uh, chopped onion. And a little bit of, uh, we went with a pineapple-based, uh, plant-based uh, fish sauce. Typically, they use uh, regular fish sauce or even use uh, squid. Uh, and then uh, scallion and ginger. So it's, 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 again, it's a very simple recipe if it's put together. So in goes uh, some garlic. I think there's a good um, uh, analogy in the Noma uh, cookbook. It says for this kind of uh, uh, lack of fermentation, I think Professor is going to explain that better. So in, 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 in Noam, I think they say um, uh, uh, fermentation is like, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's like a, uh, going to a party or going to a club where, um, you know, it, fermentation and rotting are kind of similar. It's like going to a club. Uh, rotting is where everybody's gotten into the club and it's a mess. Uh, in, in if it's fermentation controlled by us, then you know we are like the bouncer, and we we prevent the unwanted people in, and we we, we keep the party going for a long while. So it's kind of a, it's, a, it's a good analogy, right? So that was onion. Yeah, yes, yeah. so onion, ginger, garlic. Um, I'm just going to make it a make it a, make a paste of that, and then. This is uh, the gochugaru. Um, I'm not following the exact recipe as per it's. I think uh, Rebecca is going to share it with the. Uh, yeah, all the recipes from today will be shared with you, yeah. so that you can follow along. Can't too much of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Whilst DJ's doing that, I'll fill in, please. Yeah. Hard to cook and talk at the same time, yeah. I guess. So um, fermentation of cabbage goes way back. Um, to the early civilization again. And our ancestors were clever because they saw cabbage as a perfect uh, pickling material because it had high natural sugars of all the fructose, glucose and sucrose and it has the texture which is important. And obviously you've heard of sauerkraut. Uh, so sauerkraut is a German. They've got Iranian, Persian, Asian variations and Korea does kimchi. So as VJ rightly said, uh, one of the critical parts of making a good uh, sauerkraut or kimchi is getting the salt right. So I know uh, chefs by nature just like to be a bit liberal, you know, scales of other people, but you've got to get the salt right about one to, well, two to three percent, I would say. And the reason for that, as VJ rightly said, if you go under that, your cabbage just rots. If you go over that, it goes mouldy. And the reason why there's a special narrow um, window of uh, salt concentration is because you want to stimulate the lactic acid bacteria. So what happens is the lactics start taking off, uh, leuconostoc first, producing uh, things like uh, menthol and a bit of acid and a bit of acetic acid. Then lactobacillus brevis takes so, which produces ethanol, acetate and lactate, and it finally goes to plantarum. So it's like a free stage. Uh, so sauerkraut, that's why it tastes as it does, a nice mixture of flavours. Now with kimchi, it's a bit like, um, well, I will say taking big risks, but you don't get as much acidity. And because of that, 
it's more prone to spoilage, it's more prone to foodborne pathogens. So There's last year, for example, here. there was an E. coli outbreak linked to Kamichi, which was um, actually bought off the internet, going back to your last question. So when you're doing uh, this at home, uh, just me weigh, measure the salt to make sure it's at uh, 2 to 3%. If you go over too bad if you go under. But uh, certainly it's more tasteful than sauerkraut, because sauerkraut's just cabbage, isn't it? So you've got a few flavours in there for sure. Mm -hmm. And what it's going to do after um, you've made this, you've got to kind of put it into, make sure the salt's uh, well mixed like this. And I guess you put it into jars, and you've got to leave it time to ferment, let it do its thing. And you've just got to make sure it's around about 30 degrees C. Um, and it's a danger zone because this is where pathogens can come in if you haven't had enough salt to play and grow and cause issues. But you've got to give it time to ferment. And people have different opinions when it's completed. I think some people actually just taste it and say, yep, that's good to go. Other people do it by a certain time. Um, Sometimes, but, yeah, you, you don't even just have the time to wait. <laughs> well, I would, like a PJ's well, operation. I would suggest not to taste it quite right yet. Yeah. Let, it, <laughs> let it cook first. Yeah, it? So, uh, it's kind of so that you have done a very quick process. So for us, we let it sit for the kimchi that you have on your place is uh, just close to a week uh, now. So we made it last week and and uh, when we, and uh, you know, at about 30 to 36 hours, you know, when we open the jar, you can really start seeing the little bubbles, and we start seeing the fermentation, and and it, it really tastes after a week or two, it gets better and better. I think when the recipes are just right and the conditions are just right, uh, as they do it in traditional Korea, it lasts for a long time, and, and it's really really healthy. So uh, we leave it leave it like this. Take, I mean, uh, taste it, leave it in the fridge, or you know, till it gets going. Have uh, you seen all these uh, different? Yeah, some people say leave it in the fridge and it takes longer, otherwise you leave it outside. And like uh, Professor Keith said, you know, you, you gotta be you gotta be very, very sure of the recipes and, and, and what you do so. Oh yeah, it's always a balancing act. Yeah. <laughs> How much you, like yeah. you can be cheap. <laughs> Here at our food lab, one of our, our classes is preservation. And we have the students make kimchi and sometimes we mess up the recipe on purpose. Of course. So that's a learning process. So we can see and it definitely oh, so when they if, get you, Ill. if you mess up that, that salt ratio or you, you leave it out for the wrong amount of time, it definitely goes moldy. So Oh I'm just saying don't yeah. wait to see how many go well and say, Well there you go. You lost yeah. a lesson, isn't it? But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you just Lots to learn. No, it's safe, but you've got to be careful at the same time. Yeah, no, it's great. Okay, so that was great to, to learn a little bit about fermentation there. And then while um, VJ is kind of about to, to get set up then for the next one, VJ has been mentioning a lot uh, about Noma, and I'm not sure if everyone in the room knows what Noma is. Um, Noma is actually a restaurant. It was one of the number one restaurants in the world based out of uh, Denmark. And uh, Renny Redzepe is kind of like the brainchild there, but they're also David Zilber, who's actually a Canadian, um, who did a lot of the science behind fermentation. And it kind of really caught a lot of people's eyes and kind of took over the culinary world. Everyone wanted to incorporate fermentation into their into their food, and um, it was definitely there was a lot of innovation happening. Um, and there's a lot that we learned from it, and, and yeah. pretty much pretty much every chef will yes. always mention it <laughs> um, as being a huge part. But I think yeah. you know in Canada. Um, it's, it's amazing that like a Canadian was involved in that, that is, think, um, and I, we have a very similar cuisine I think as yeah. well at the, the northern cuisine and hopefully we see some kind of innovation like that uh, continue here in Canada in our own homeland mm -hmm. yeah so fish. now we're going to move on to fish yeah. so what are we doing with this fish today yeah. DJ? So, yeah so it's uh, it's arctic char it's, uh, so we're just going to cure arctic char just another one more uh, one more way to cure uh, fish or preserve food um, uh, on campus, we have we have an Alma research station where we uh, where Marcia she is there and we, we work very well with her. So we have an Arcticar research program. So for the last six to seven years, I think for anybody who has uh, eaten any of the special events on campus, I'm sure we would have had Arcticar. This is kind of one of our <laughs> one of our staples. I think we uh, we started this. I think again, you know, we we fought, uh, Jason and some of our chefs, we all follow some of the good chefs and who are trend-setting chefs. Uh, we kind of really started off uh, doing uh, Thomas Keller's standard uh, 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 the salmon cones. So I think we kind of uh, took, uh, took note of that and we cured our teacher, the university's hot teacher, and we served it in a corner that became a, that was quite kind of well, well received on campus. So we've done Quite a few different variations of architecture on campus for, for many, many special events because I think uh, the president's office likes to uh, showcase what we do on campus. So, 
the active char and the convolved potatoes and the and the and the asparagus and uh, some of the dairy and uh, the honey and kind of all of that always shows up in the menus in some way or the other. So it's kind of ready to highlight what we do on campus. Uh, uh, another note: uh, the fish on campus. We uh, we only buy ocean-wide certified fish. We really understand the the scope of the problem and what what uh, as a big buying power. We 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 try to influence. Uh, influence other uh, universities as well and, and and just really to do the right thing. And so OceanWise, maybe yeah. a lot of people don't know what OceanWise yeah. is. Yeah. Is it, so, yeah, can you Ocean, explain that? Sure. OceanWise is an organization that uh, uh, kind of really gives a check mark to certain fisheries that are deemed sustainable. Uh, there's, I mean, and so in that, for, you know, in that there's a lot of fish that are can, kind of considered completely, you know, almost, uh, you know, fished out the extinction. Then there's certain fish that are coming back. Again, we all, there are lots of books out there which talk about uh, uh, fish and how much of it is left. And you know, there are a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, uh, for and against arguments about uh, the big uh, farming, uh, fish farming and, you know, genetic modified fish and, and I'm sure that's, that's another a, deep fish dialogue yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's, 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 a, no, there's, okay. there's lots of various opinions so uh, for us on campus we try to make sure we buy only ocean by certified fish so it's kind of limited us in what we can offer because there are only very few fish that we can kind of buy uh, being you know we have to watch our costs as well so uh, much of our fish actually are salmon because we have we started our own sushi program it is very very busy we do uh, so we we buy our fish from a farm called, or a company called Sustainable Blue. There's, they are based out of uh, Nova Scotia. It's an inland uh, Atlantic salmon uh, uh, breeding uh, or farm. Uh, they claim to have claim to not release any water back in the oceans, and you know, uh, they repurpose the water, reuse the water. There's, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of there are a lot of great things about the farm. It's way more expensive than what we can generally find, but we want to make sure we do the right thing. So all of our all of our salmon for our on campus we buy is from Sustainable Blue, it's from Nova Scotia. I know there's a there's a there's a current footprint of flying it from there, but um, it is part of it. Uh, we also work with the Izumi Aquaculture. They are actually we went over there uh, a few weeks back. Uh, they are actually growing uh, steelhead trout in, and some of the, um, uh, some of the, um, uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, some of the um, quarry ponds in Pushland. So it's really 15 minutes away from uh, from campus. So we we plan to include that fish into some of our menus as well. So uh, that's a that's a great story right there. I think they have they have worked with students on campus, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we are working on it. We are working to try to get those things on campus. Actually. That's great. Okay, so now with with this char that you sure. have, you're going to cure cure yeah. it and walk us through that. Yes. Okay. What is what is curing? <laughs> uh, curing really is to uh, you know in the, in 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 case of the fish, uh, we're going to uh, uh, really cover it up with salt. Uh, uh, for us, uh, we've tried various recipes. Uh, this recipe really has been perfected by Jason. Jason does all the curing in campus, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's more sugar, salt. Uh, we have some star anise. Uh, you know, uh, lemon zest, lime zest, uh, orange zest, a little bit of cilantro, some lemongrass. It's it's a citrus cure. Uh, so uh, once the fish is filled, uh, the pin bones out. Uh, we cover it with the with the curing mixture for 24 hours, and we really check the flesh for another. You know, we ch uh, check the fish and see how it feels. A lot, you know, a recipes are recipes, but you know, it's, it's we kind of treat it as a guide, and then we really have to know uh, with experience. We kind of know hey, it's, it is done and it's cured enough or not. Uh, and or give it more time. Once once you feel it's cured enough, uh, we take we scrape the salt off quickly, give it a good rinse, and leave it in the fridge just so that it dries out, and then we can slice and serve. So uh, this was cured on Monday night. The, we got the fish in on Monday night. We cured it Monday night, and we got it out of the yeah Monday night, and uh, we pull it out on uh, Wednesday morning, and we slice it today uh, today morning. So. Okay. Uh, curing really is to, I'm sure Professor is going to give me <laughs> more uh, detail, but really just to reduce the water content uh, of, uh, here in this case, it's the fish. So I think typically they're probably 70 or 80 percent water content, moisture content. I think the salt draws out all the moisture and uh, uh, makes it safer, right? Yeah, you got it right, DJ. So, you know, going back to the olden days again, obviously fish is very perishable. We had yep. no refrigeration, no ice. So what they had to do to when they caught the catch is to preserve it by curing. 
And what salt does is like a, it's literally a magnet for water, so it starts drawing the moisture out of the actual fish itself to alter its texture, stop those enzymes that degrade it, but obviously also stop microbes from growing. So uh, this is, uh, I would imagine, not as salty as the olden day uh, salt, where it was very salty and you had to actually soak it uh, in order to actually be able to even eat it. Yeah. It was fairly pliable. So what it, you'll notice is the very distinct uh, subtle flavour of the fish and lots of fish different fish types I guess can be even oily fish can be uh, cured and all these other yeah. sort of types of fish so it's a good way of preserving but uh, certainly we just use it for the taste these days uh, to do that yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's, it's I did a very quick shot so it's very simple so we basically get uh, sugar and salt together put in all these ingredients mix it all up uh, and then pack the fish put it away in the fridge uh, look at it the next day give it you know, 24 hours, and again, it depends on the size, thickness of the fillet, the size of the fillet. Uh, there are lots of uh, you know minor variables that you have to look at, and then you know uh, you can take it out. Uh, that's how the fish looks. It gets a beautiful color. Uh, different, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you look at the rib, the fish is usually not that bright, but once the water draws out, and the color is amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and and for presentation, I think we have a couple of photographs later to show you yeah, uh, what it looks like after. Yeah, like so, as the food safety word, not to put you off your uh, cured fish. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a, uh, an outbreak, not an outbreak, a case of Vibrio vulnificus just last week uh, in the US where somebody had tried to cure fish, they didn't do it right, and when you get Vibrio, it's that flesh eater, they had to cut her arms and legs off and oh, fall well that's what she thought, uh, but the point is, is that you've also got to be careful not to vacuum pack fish because it causes botulinum to grow, but like you said VJ, as long as you kind of Follow the rules in terms of yeah, a very liberal amount of salt in the refrigerator and eat it within a few days, you're good. Thank you. Not to put you off. So this is good my Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> You, when you're talking, I get a little scared. I'm like, how, 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 how many times feel? have I have I dodged a foodborne illness in my life? Well, but you know, that's the trouble, isn't it? You know. Yeah. <laughs> You don't want to go out any time, do you? No, no. But anyway, no. And I, I keep know, eating your cured fish, though. Yeah, and I know um, chefs like VJ put a lot of attention into making sure that food is prepared safely. That's your, your number one concern. You want to make Absolutely, sure everyone yes. is always healthy and yeah. enjoys their food. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there's no question about it. I think for us in the kitchen and for in the hospitality, uh, it is the number one priority is to make sure food is safe. Uh, you know, if something goes wrong, it is not one or two people. It is it is a huge number of people who fall sick. So uh, that is one of the scariest things that I could ever think of. And uh, and, uh, and and so we, we are very very conscious about what we do. We don't take any any risks. So it's 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 number one. So very good. That's good. So I, I we're coming close to the the end of the time. Is there anything though, Keith, that you wanted to to wrap up with with anything to do with? Pickling or oh, fermenting. Sorry, so or curing. in general. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the only tips I can give you is that when you're preparing anything, you know, you, you wash your hands, you measure things. You know, you measure the vinegar, you measure the salt. You don't uh, kind of be liberal with it. Uh, sterilize the containers. Keep it refrigerated. If it doesn't smell right or doesn't taste right, then just don't eat it. Um, fermentations are natural, and naturally things can go wrong. But apart from that, you know, it's uh, a proven recipe and it should be fine. But you've just got to be careful if you go into the uh, sort of art of canning. Um, canning needs a lot of experience. So if you are going to do canning, uh, definitely get... Um, some expertise uh, alongside to learn how to do it and you should be safe but uh, anything with low acid you kind of steer clear of if you can. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great advice. So there are a lot of uh, different resources out there as well too, different books and Oh yeah, that's a good point. So People yeah, so uh, <laughs> so there's a site called Fight Back, uh, fight as in fight, uh, back as in B A C, and uh, that's got some good tips on pickling and canning and all things like that easy to uh, use and understand. Well, well, thank you, Keith. I um, so, you. so uh, learned so much from today and the background, and I'm going to be thinking twice every time <laughs> I, I, I eat my food, but it's really interesting to kind of get the background on why we these certain methods that we can use to preserve food are work, and, yeah. and they can help 
Keep, keep safe. Keep, keep safe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. So, uh, so thank you, Keith, for, thank you. for joining us today. And then I want to say a huge thank you to you as well, VJ. Um, it was wonderful to be able to, to have you here, watch you do some demos. And, um, of course, everyone needs to make sure you're, you go out and you eat university yes. well food. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you thank so much. You. So, as, uh, <laughs> And then just for one little, we have a little surprise at the end here. Um, so first of all, just in wrapping up Deep Dish Dialogues, I just want to say a huge thank you to the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management, and also the Errol Food Institute. They have collaborated together to be able to put together our Deep Dish Dialogue events. And our next event is actually taking place on October 12th, and we'll be exploring Indigenous education around food. But another huge supporter of our Deep Dish Dialogue series and the Anita Stewart Memorial Food Lab uh, is Food Day Canada. So I did mention Food Day Canada earlier, but Food Day Canada was uh, founded by Anita Stewart, who was the University of Guelph's food laureate. She's also, um, our food lab here is named after her because of her significant importance that she played at the University of Guelph, um, really uh, highlighting different research that takes place on campus. And we have been lucky enough to be able to really be really involved in Food Day Canada. Food Day Canada is a national celebration. It's celebrated on the Saturday of the August long weekend every year. And also we do try and celebrate it year round. But Food Day Canada partnered up with the Alora Mill and Pearl Hospitality and the Alora BIA to be able to um, do a huge fundraiser for the Anita Stewart Memorial Food Lab and the Anita Stewart Tribute Fund. So we just want to say a huge thank you to them. And we are, would like, I would like to invite everyone up to the stage. So I'd like to invite Jeff Stewart, uh, board of the Food Day Canada, then Alice Rain from the Errol Food Institute, Holmes, interim director of the School of Hospitality, Angela Samoz from the Alora Mill, and McLean Hahn as well, the chair of the Alora BIA. Great. So I would just like to, to begin by, uh, Alice has a few words she'd like to say. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Alice Rain. I'm Director of Operations at the Arnold Food Institute. Um, I am super excited every month when these Deep Dish Dialogues come around. This one is uh, no exception. It's a joy to be here to learn with everybody. Um, I'm really excited uh, by this particular episode because um, Anita not only was a great friend, but such a champion of food here at the university. Um, she, she helped us all to learn and to do better. Um, and she, in, in championing Food Day Canada, she helped us to be Canada's food university. So um, for, for me, it's, it's, it's personally meaningful, um, it's professionally impactful, um, and so just a, a, huge, a huge thank you to Food Day Canada, to uh, Pearl Hospitality, and particularly the Laura Mill for your support um, in this regard. Okay, and then next I'd like to invite Jeff Stewart. Oh, Jeff, sorry. <laughs> 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 so it was, you know, it, was, it was amazing to see the support of the University of Guelph and of course the Village of Elora and the Pearl Hospitality team for our fundraisers this year. Uh, they were you know, really well received by the community. And at the end of the Anita Stewart fundraising gala at the Elora Mill, uh, we just had a, a quick opportunity to bring together uh, anybody who was Guelph alumni in that room. And about half the room actually stood up and all came together to the front. We tried to get everybody for a photo, but it was like we need like a bigger, we've got to move further back, we need a wider angle lens. There were so many people there. And it sort of made a moment to sort of make me think like how many of those people there all flow back to Guelph, but then also have had classes like even in this lab. You know, it's amazing because, I mean, I had classes in this lab. And, I mean, it was a little bit after some of the pictures back then. <laughs> <laughs> 1903 and 1905. But it's amazing how this place has changed and evolved and continues to be an important place to learn more about food, food education, and food studies uh, so that we can advance the food systems here in Canada, which is exactly what Mom wanted to do. So I guess on that behalf, thank you to the University of Guelph but also thank you to Pearl Hospitality and Laura Mill. I'm going to pass this little microphone over to Angela, who is the cat herder to make this all happen. So thank you Thank you so much. This is by far the smallest uh, microphone I've ever held. <laughs> so um, my name is Angela. Thank you for the introduction. I am the executive assistant of um, our team at the Alora Mill will do everything we can to continue shining a light on the importance of 
good Canadian food and how privileged we are to be in this rich land of Central Washington. Uh, together, we keep honoring local ingredients, Canadian farming, and supporting talented chefs who are inspired every day by the movement Anita dedicated herself to. We hope this donation will make an impact towards the ongoing ed education of the students and also the improvement and development of culinary programs here at the University of Guelph. Thank you so much. And so I think we are going to do our check presentation and then Mark's <laughs> gonna say a few words. So I just wanna say that Angela was very modest. She did so much work as well as McLean and a, a huge community. And um, th they raised an incredible amount of money. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say the total amount? Yes, so uh, we raised $27,000 on one event alone. Uh, that was our uh, Food Day Canada Gala. Um, and that was, the goal was to raise funds for um, the Anita Stewart Tribute Fund and this um, beautiful lab you sit in right now and for the ongoing development of it. Thank you. Mark will now, now say a few words. <laughs> this is amazing. I, just on behalf of the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management, on behalf of the Aero Food Institute, on behalf of the Lang School of Business and Economics, and on behalf of the Greater University, I want to just say thank you for the donation, for all your support. I mean, beyond the money, um, Food Day Canada has been a part of what the school is, and, and, and part of what we do and provide our students for knowledge and expertise. Um, you know, the, the lab you're in today, book, learn about food science, learn how not to, um, you know, cause any issues when we're pickling <laughs> food. Um, but it also provides a space that we get to live on in Anita's memory and spirit. She always wanted to see students learning and, and really diving into Canada's food system. And that's really what the space allows us to do. And through your donation, you know, thank you to Food Day Canada, thank you to the Laura Mill, thank you to Pearl Hospitality, thank you for uh, all the support you provide the school, whether it be funding or your support or your, your presence here and when you hold these events. This space gets to allow us to bring together academics and researchers and students to really experience food and talk about food. And this, uh, these funds will help us to see deep dish dialogues continue for the year ahead. Thank you very much.